Hey, this is Bob Nalbandian from the Shockwaves Hard Radio Podcast, the Shockwave Skull Sessions Podcast, and the Shockwaves Videocast. And you are tuned in to Focus on Metal. Hey, Metalheads, Scott here. And Richie. And uh, as Richie said just uh, before we started recording, uh, kind of a... Sucky day. Kind of a, yeah, a little bit of a Donner episode this week, but it, it, it has to be done. You know, basically, a good friend of ours passed away on the 30th of December, that being Bob Nelbandian, who, in all honesty, without Bob, there probably wouldn't be a focus on metal. For me, a yes... I have to agree there. Yeah, I mean, he was, uh, you know, I corresponded with Bob before the show, but kind of a lot of the, kind of the the idea behind it, the ethos, the approach, a lot of it came from stuff that Bob was doing before us. Yeah, I think think before we get into it a little bit, we need to discuss who he was and what, what, what he did that made us do the show. Yeah, well, I was going to put that into context, yeah, but yeah. I'm just, you know, up front, um, you know, and I said it when I put it on Twitter as well, is that, uh, you know, he, he definitely was a, a, a big part of the underpinning of the show. And and again, now, so, you know, what Richie's talking about is, uh, you know, the guy just, it, you know, he had an amazing history and, uh, you know, it hit me pretty hard, too, because uh, Bob and I, we're the same age. And uh, I probably would have stuck closer into a lot of the music if I had known him back in 82, you know. But it's interesting to think that back in 82, you know, Bob is doing his uh, first fanzine out there with the headbanger. Yeah. I think he started that, I want to say, like, April. So, like, that's, you know, my senior year. And within, I want to say, six months of that or so, I would have been... On the radio, doing one of the first metal shows in the Merrimack Valley. Meanwhile, Bob's out in California doing all the magical stuff that he did. But the fact that, you know, he was really part of that whole core of that. And one of the first people to really write about Armored Saint and Slayer, um, obviously Metallica. Uh, you know, it's incredible that that he, how baked into the history that he is. And yet a lot of people... Don't even, unfortunately, know the guy's name. Yeah, he was... Uh, we've interviewed him a few times. Massive, yep. massive fan. Very, very knowledgeable. Yeah, yeah. Um, what used to blow my mind a lot was I used to post on Facebook all these old flyers of shows. Yep. And, of course, you know, I might ask Bob, were you at that? And he'd say, oh, yeah, I was at that show uh, the one two nights before. Yep. And, and I'd be like, ah, bastard <laughs> yeah I'd be envious you know yeah, he was always, always always good for that stuff but it was the, the thing that was so disarming about bob too was you know a lot of times he was right in the middle of the storm all the time going all the way and you'd never know it the guy never had airs about him uh always had good words to say and he was never, he never had a, like this inflated sense of himself. And unless you knew, you'd never, you know, suspect like how invaluable he was to a lot of what we know today is metal. And, and, and you just, like I said, he just was so low key and down to earth that, yeah, you just never, you never knew until you started talking to him. As someone coming from Ireland and Europe, we had the Metal Hammers and the Krangs and, yeah. and those sort of magazines. Um, over here, did Bob write for any of those magazines, like some Metal Edge and He did stuff Circus, for a, Cream. a bunch of other ones as contributing editors. Cream was one of them okay. that he did. Um, yeah, so he did do a, a bunch of that stuff. And then obviously... Did he do Rip? He, As far as I know, he did not do Rip. Okay. And then he did some, two of the... Uh, two men's magazines he wrote for too. That was we had some interesting stories and talks about that one <laughs> off air. Yeah, he you know he he did a lot of that. He uh, 
we'll probably never fully know all of the different signings and stuff that he was involved with, with tons of labels as well, that he did a lot of behind the scenes stuff. So that's, you know, pretty amazing as well. Uh, but just even some of the other stuff, like I, I know I still go back and, and think about like with, with the headbanger with the zine and just so people know too, if you're interested in reading issue one of the headbanger, and I checked today because we had it as an article on the site years ago, but it is still available as a, I think a Kindle edition on Amazon. So it's like two ninety nine. So okay. you can get issue one. And, the, and what Bob was going to do is he wanted to dig all those out. And I think he was going to do it with uh, Japanime and, and just try to get them all rolled out again so that, you know, basically people like you and I could go back and read all of that stuff again. But issue number one is still available up there. Yeah. So. Yeah. So where Bob comes in for me is the Skull Sessions. Yeah. Um. Huge impact on me. I was listening to the Skull Sessions before I moved here. I'm, I'm living here nearly 13 years now. And um, what I loved about Bob, Bob's Skull Sessions was, it was just a, a discussion. It was like a, a pub discussion with friends. Yeah, right. On audio as a podcast. Right. And that's kind of like I said, this is, that's where that type of thing yeah. is, was a basis for here was like what we're doing now, which is just a couple of people just shooting the shit. And so that, that kind of thing that appealed to you to listen to and appealed to me to listen to, um, yeah, we, we you know, did our best to, to bake that into what became Focus on Metal. And then the other one, and I had to wear it in his honor, but was uh, Hard Radio. That's right. That, that <laughs> so, was more interview-based yeah, than, so, than uh, discussion. That one there. But, and, I, you know, what I liked about the Skull Session one, too, and probably one of my well, – I had two that were favorites. One was one where we went back and he was reminiscing with guys from Snow – which was absolutely hilarious. Um, That's Carlos. Cavazzo. Especially the monkey story. But then the other one was he had done one of his first interviews. I think it was his first like interview was with Dio. That's right. And I've I remember him rerunning it. And I can remember last week, I think it was last week, I happened to find that somebody had posted Dreamers Never Die up on YouTube. That's right. And... I just was like, okay, so I watched about half of it, and then I figured I'd watch the rest of it, and then it got taken down. But when the camera pans to Dio's house, the first thought I had was, like, wow, that it was Bob pedaling on his bike up to that house. And, like, what must have been going through his mind to go and interview Dio? And, like, holy crap. And then you listen to the interview, and he did an incredible freaking job on it, you know? And, uh, yeah, I just... You know, a lot of stuff. I just think about all the stuff that, that Bob did, and it's amazing. Mm. I think the, the episode of the Skull Sessions that really piqued my interest and said, right, I'd love to do something like that. And I ended up doing it with Dio Strange Highways. He had Bill Ward go through the Black Sabbath discography. Yeah. And I thought that was an amazing episode. Yeah. That he could get a musician that played on all those records and go through them chronologically. And he could get Bill to remember. Yeah. Now, and what he did, what he'd done before that was, he'd had guys that he knew, like friends of his, that like John Stranansky and mm-hmm. I think Ron Quintana, um, I can't, Monty Connor and yep. um, you know friends of his over the years. Yep. they'd come on and they'd do the discography episodes, yeah. but yeah. he actually got Bill to do it. Yeah, and it was amazing. And I, I always that always stuck in the back of my mind. And and I said, right, I'd fucking love to do something like that. Mm-hmm. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to do something along those lines, but it was Bob that really yeah. put the seed in it for yeah. me. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, he's he's baked into a lot of this, and he was always so good about, um, you know, like, so we've had, we had Bob on the show five times. So probably put it in the show notes as well, but, uh, you know, he started off, first time he came on was episode 202, which was back in 2014. And uh, that was to discuss, it couldn't have been 2014, that date's got to be wrong, Um, (laughs) but to uh, discuss the Inside Metal, the first one that came out. documentary. Then he he came back on for talking about the third edition of Inside Metal, 
he had Carl come on at one point because he was like, I want you to talk to Carl. Carl so, Alvarez. Yeah, yeah, which is, again, it's typical Bob. Like, yeah. I don't want to have the spotlight all the time. I got this great guy I'm working with. You know, hey, can you can you talk to Carl instead? That That's Bob. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not Never egotistical. Carl is another guy that comes on the Facebook page mm-hmm. and uh, he'll comment on old yeah. concerts out there. Yeah. I was at the, you know, the... The, the, pre, the album release party and yeah. all the guys were cool and yeah. I, was, I was at this show at the Stone or the Omni or where, wherever yeah. it was. Yeah, and so we had, so we had Carl on for that, but then um, we had him back on for uh, episode four hundred five, the band versus brand. That's and, a great documentary. Um, we had him on at episode four seventy six for Bay Area Godfathers Part One, and um, then we had him back on again for the last time for four, on episode four ninety four which was in uh, March of 2021 for Bay Area Part 2. And, uh, you know, part of that thing that, you know, Bob and I talked about, too, was that, you know, he was, he liked that concept of, okay, I did L.A., did San Francisco, which is great. Those are the two big nascent scenes, you know, then you kind of add New York into that, but he covered the ones he knew the best. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he had talked about, hey, you know, I'd love to, come out, we can do a Boston one, and that was kind of something I was looking forward to. Was, oh, wow, great. I could work on a documentary with Bob about about the Boston scene as well. Um, but those documentaries, they're, just the way that he did those, it's almost like video skull sessions because it's very conversational. A lot of it is, you know, on the porch talking and stuff, and it's, it's great. In fact, um, it's funny because, you know, I've got three copies of the first one over there because one's the first screener, then they did the new cut, and I got the the next screener, and then I have an actual final copy of part one, and then they split to part two. But it wasn't until, I want to say, maybe two years or so after that came out that I ever watched through the credits to realize that Bob put me in the credits. And I never even knew it. (laughs) But we had done a lot of back and forth, and he had had me look at stuff ahead of time and give him feedback and stuff like that. And, and uh, yeah, I just, I never even, and he never mentioned it. I just never, I never realized it. And then I think the family was away and I was like, oh, I'm going to kick back and sit here with the dogs. And I just happened to be watching the credits after and was like, son of a bitch, you put me in the credits. Nice. I didn't even know it. Nice. The other thing you did too was, I don't know if you ever saw this, but the, um, the premiere. He sent me one of those. Oh, you got it signed. He yeah. he um he mailed me a poster. Yeah. Um, and I still have it for the inside metal. So I you know I got got Bob's signature on it. So um, he had had put me. I just I just couldn't get out there. But he, you know he was like he wanted me to go out to the premiere. He wanted me to go as well. And, yeah. And I'm like, well, really? Yeah. Like I said, he was like so like just really giving and non egotistical and. Um, he had invited me to, to Nam twice. Again, I just couldn't get shit together to go out. But, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I'm, I'm blown away that he's gone. I really am. Yeah. Um, he contacted me a, 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 well over a year now. He's had me on this, on his podcast a couple yep, of times. That's right. Um, and the interesting one was, one of the episodes I did was about, growing up in Ireland and the music mm. we listened to. And, um, and of course, my best friend, Tom Brennan, was, uh, he met him in, L- in, uh, in L.A. because Tom works at Water for Crystal, so he does a lot of traveling, right? Right. right. And he's been, he, me and him, me and Tom were on the podcast with Matt and Bob. Mm. And actually, Tom, t- my friend Tommy was probably in touch with Bob more than I was. He was the one who actually contacted me and said, I just found out Bob had died, mm. and I was in shock. And of course, Tom was as well. And um, but when you look back now, there'd really been nothing from him in a while. Yeah. And I, I was in. I hadn't really been in contact with him much in the last probably six months. Um. Anyway, and I figured he was. The skull sessions had basically ceased. Mm-hmm. You know. He, what you done before? Yeah, he, he, done, yeah. I, I honestly huh. thought he was doing another documentary. Yeah. Well, he he would. I mean, that was 
you know, we talked about, it's like, you know, why'd you, you know, move and stuff. And it was, you know, well, it's, this is going to be more, it's easier for me to work and stuff like that. So, yeah. it's, and it's, it wasn't unusual for Bob to kind of drop out. And the more he did the documentaries, the longer he would drop out with periods. And then he'd come back, oh yeah, I was doing this and this. And you know, I just well, couldn't contact Well, he wasn't married, was he? I mean, no, no kids. No. So he so just he did was, his own he could thing. move around. Yeah. As if so I got used to him just like either dropping off or the, you know, the skull sessions would, would drop off or something mm -hmm. and then come back. And it, it was kind of, you know, usual behavior. So you don't really think much about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, you were lucky to get on. I had, I want to say it was either two or three opportunities. I was supposed to go on to do new album stuff. And then he hit me up and he was, and, cause then he had somebody who was more of a, uh, you know, like a band name. And it's like, yeah, of course you're much better off doing that. You know, especially for the show and stuff. It's kind of like, compare me to them. It's yeah, that's like, what yeah, blew me away. It. He'd contact me and say, Richie, I want to do a Skull Sessions. Will you come on? And yeah. I'm thinking, you want to ask me? Yeah. I, said, I was like, I'd love to do it, but, and, and thank you. Yeah. But I'm thinking, <laughs> like, you, you could probably get Joey Vera or, you know, someone right, with a higher right. profile name than yeah. me. And he just didn't give a shit. He's like, yeah. no, I just want to talk to you and yeah. you can come on and we'll shoot the shit and do, a, do an episode. And I was like, Wow, thanks. Yeah, that's I mean that's again that's that's Bob. That's part of what, you know, I was really I liked about the guy is that he again, he he like he had no ego at all and he was just really giving all the time. I don't know how big a follower you are of the classic metal show. But um I know they did uh they they yeah, did, did I, the I, first retro that they did out. Yeah, I tweeted that out too. Yeah, I, I, I know Chris Aiken and Neely had hit him very hard and they were very good friends with mm -hmm. Bob. Um, they knew him a lot better than we did. Um, and Bob was on the CMS. He was a, pretty much a, a regular on it. Yeah. He'd call in every couple of weeks and, you know, he'd just call in as a guest. Yeah. They'd be talking about something and next thing, Bob yeah. Nalbandian, he'd be listening to the show and he'd call in. Yeah. Um, I, I do know that when word got out, uh, there was a lot of shows like ours uh, that were shocked. Mm -hmm. And they all posted about it. And a lot of people, they knew Bob, but they didn't really know him. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, we, we knew him to interview him and that we never met him. And uh, his influence is large. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. And like I said, he was, a, I mean, a good guy. There's a, there's, was, kind of wish I kept all of the stuff that we never put on, but it's like we would, you know, and there's plenty of people on too that are, um, especially folks like around my age that, you know, there's just, we'd like get on and, and shoot the shit about like all kinds of stuff. And then naughty, and it's not stuff that ever made it to the show. Some of it couldn't make it to the show no. either, but it was, <laughs> it was, you know, it was the same thing with, you know, um, I know it's kind of bizarre, but like with Nick Menza, I had a lot of conversations with Nick Menza. What's bizarre is that Nick Menza posted about being devastated that Bob was gone. Like, okay, who's who's posting on Nick Menza's oh, Twitter? Yeah. But it was like... Yeah, it did, it's the same on the Facebook page. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the same thing was you know, with Nick. Actually, with Chris Poland, too. I, I God, I shot the shit with Chris a lot and um, Chris Oliva um, John Oliva sorry same thing it was like there was I don't know how long we talked about like the freaking Beatles one day you know so there's a lot of stuff that yeah just never makes it on the air that you kind of actually have a much better sense of the person when you're just talking back and forth and you know talking about shit but yeah it's like I said it it, it hit me pretty hard especially the fact that you know being the same age too and stuff it's like Holy crap. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, of course, the night we're taping this, um, we just found out Jeff Beck died. Yeah. Um, I can't say I'm a massive fan of the guy because I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I saw him once in Dublin in Marley Park, and he was either, he was either supporting Sting or Paul Weller. Mm. Um, and I didn't go to see Jeff Beck. I was, he just happened to be supporting. So yeah. I, I can say I saw the guy, but yeah. I mightn't be a fan of the guy, but my God, there's some fucking amount of guitar players who talked about him as an influence. He, he's, I mean, I, that was my first thing was, you know, just he was one of my initial first influences because he was, he was all over the place and, and everything he did, he was amazing at. Um, 
and yeah, I, you know, I and then I tweeted out tonight too that you know I tweeted out my my pass from the show he did in '80 down in Cape Cod. Um, but he, you know, he would even pop up. He popped up down the street here one night at the uh, back page. No way. Yeah. The and pub? It was. Um, I can't remember who was playing that night, but he was basically in town and he popped in and he jammed. And I got like a hey. Do you know Beck's down here playing? And, of course, that's when I was up in Belvedere, but it was like, shit. But, yeah, I mean. Did you go? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to see him in a little room. Was you it know? packed? No. Because people this didn't pre- really know. Was this pre-cell phone? No, this was, um, this was with cell phone. Yeah. Oh, so it wasn't that yeah. long ago. What, no, it wasn't that years? long ago. Probably was a little bit longer than that. Okay. Yeah, time flies when you're divorced. Um, but you know, it was when I had the house, yeah, and he would just, he just popped up. I, I can't think of who it was. I, I mean, I wasn't that surprised only because, um, across from the auditorium down there, there's that basically hole by the river, which that used to be a club called the raft. Mm-hmm. And you, it would be, not be unusual to have somebody like Pat Metheny show up. I, I mean, I sat next to Pat Metheny one night. His brother Mike was playing, and next thing you know, I'm like, oh, crap, sitting next to Pat Metheny. He just, like, dropped in. He's hanging out and stuff. And there were people who were in and out of there all the time. Terrible place to do sound in because you had a brick wall right behind your head. But, um, yeah, it, I think just just an amazing player. Even if you see the any of the, sh- the stuff he did with the um, – and they have it on YouTube and cable and stuff, but like the Ronnie Scott shows that he did. And, and even when the camera pans to the audience and you see like all kinds of other people that are, that are at Ronnie Scott's watching that and just the interplay between, you know, him and, and Tal Wilkerson. And it's just amazing. And then the fact that he's doing the whole thing, never uses a pick. It's always his fingers and his tone is always spot on. And the guy was amazing. Always struck me as one of these guys that never chased the MTV nope. thing. It nope. was always, this is my path, this is where I want to go. Yeah, knew, I mean, even in, in a way, to do. it's like a Michael Shanker thing, right? Here he is, he's in the Yardbirds, right? At that point, you know, a massive band. He's doing things like, you know, Shape of Things. And that's all Jeff Beck, you know? And then he just decides, fuck it. And he walks off. Of course, leaving poor Jimmy Page to be like, what the fuck? <laughs> right? Which, you know, made Pagey's career, but still it was like the fact that just like Shanker walking out of the Scorpions and, and walking out of UFO, it's like he just decided, no, this isn't working for me now. This is, nope. I'm going to go do my own thing. And uh, and he did. And then think about, you know, when you look at stuff like the first couple of solo albums that he that he put out. Is and, it Truth is the yeah, one that people always talk yeah, about? Yeah, Truth and, and Beckola, and you listen to those, and it's like, holy crap. And that's, you know, that's, um, you know, the, the earlier ones, that's with the Les Paul, too, and, and just the sound he got with that, and then, you know, finding what he needed in the Strat and sticking with that. Um, just, again, the tone and stuff that he did with minimal, he's not having tons of these boxes that I'm so in love with. Yeah, I, uh, it's, it's uh, again, it's it's been a shitty year. Uh, 78 <laughs> years old. Yeah, yeah. All these guys are, they're up there. Yeah, they are, because I, I think what? I think Paige just turned 78 or 79 yep. a couple of days ago, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ozzy is 73, 74 supposedly going on tour with Judas Priest in four or five weeks' time. Um, I don't know. I don't see that one happening. I can't see, I can't see it happening. As we're taping this, I, I've always maintained that I, I can't see it happening. But yeah. if he does pull it off, more power to him. Um, I just worry it, it's going to end up killing him. With, yeah. He's just not been happy with his recovery rate. Mm. You know? Halford's up there. Yeah, he is. Um, Tipton. Tipton, I think, is mid-70s. Yeah. Steven Tyler, mid-70s. That's a whole other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, go see him when they're still going, because you never know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it's, and I think, yeah, that's the other thing, you know, that creeps up with, like, with Beck is the fact that it's not like he was, 
um, you know, not running around the stage or anything like that. He's, you know, pretty much a stay in place, kind of low energy, just kind of has this presence to him. And um, he would, you just think, oh, he can keep doing this forever. Were you someone who bought everything he released? Not everything. There were some things where it was like, eh, you know, like the, there was an album he did. It was a tribute to the, the Blue Caps, and it was like, nah, I'm not really. I mean, it, it, it kind of let you see where he came with the finger style and all that, but it was like, nah, you know, don't like that. But, yeah, some of the, the you know, the Yardbirds stuff, I just actually just bought a uh, limited run Best of the Yardbirds vinyl in December. Uh, and then some of the earlier stuff I really liked as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, we're, we're, you know, we're, I knew we were going to come down. We're going to talk about Bob Nalbandian. So it got me thinking that I'm doing the show 10 years now. You're doing a 12. And off the top of my head, I was, I was thinking, right, who have I interviewed on the show that has since passed away? Mm-hmm. And I, could, I came up with four or five names, and I'm probably going to name name them, and you're going to go, what about this guy, and what about this guy? Maybe. If, if you do, <laughs> tell me. Uh, well, producers Keith Olsen and Chris Sangarides, Sangarides was two. two. And Keith, both of them were great. They yep. spoke to us for like an hour and a half or more. Uh, Pat Torpy, the yep. drummer for Mr. Big, yep. uh, was one. Malcolm Dome, mm-hmm. who did Kerrang, was another. Yep. Um... And now I'm drawing a blank. So we had Nick Menza on. We actually oh, did you, his you last, interviewed him. I didn't. We had his last interview. I um, didn't uh, talk to him. Kind of a point of pride for me with that one. Yeah. Because he, he liked me enough that when all the stuff started coming out, it was basically, hey, Nick knows you'll treat him fairly, and he wants to come on. And, yeah, so we were we were his last interview. So, uh, But I was, like I said, it was it was a... I mean, like you do too. You get people that that say, "Wow, you know, I really like that interview that you did and stuff." And it it's like great. It kind of makes you feel good. And and knowing that he, you know, wanted to do that, it sucked when he you know passed away shortly after. Um, but yeah, that that was another one. Was was Nick? And we, we've done we've done so many interviews. It was um, oh, I can't think of her name now. Like if I go back through. Even when I go back through episodes and I go, oh, yeah, we had that person and we had that person on. We had one of the female singers from one of the bands here on the East Coast. She passed away, I think, about a year after we had her on. And I think, I know we had more than that because I think we, at one time, we had this almost sick thing we had of like, well, geez, every time we talk to somebody, they die or they get (laughs) sick. Yeah, but yeah, and it's weird too because I go and you know you've got like IDs from these people, and it's like well, I can't really play that ID anymore. Just you know, because <laughs> they're dead. You know, it's just yeah, it's just weird. It just feels weird to do that. Mm. I'm fortunate I've, I've been able to speak to these people. Yeah, um, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm blessed that I actually got to talk to them. But as the years go on and we do the show. These things happen more and more and more, especially, I think, with the music that we cover. A lot of it is yeah. the older style of Very metal true. and hard rock. Yep. And a lot of the guys that I'm talking to now that when I get into metal in the 80s, they're all 60. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. And they've got a lot of road miles on them. And uh, some of them are 70. Uh-huh. In the 70s. Like, I've spoken to Carmine. Carolyn loads of times and he's I know he's up there that's another well. that's another guy that you know before an interview like Carmine and I will we'll shoot the shit yeah because it's like a lot of it is like hey remember this club oh yeah I remember this club and because it's like playing a lot of the same clubs that aren't here anymore and stuff or just other shit around that that you know Carmine's like oh yeah that's right you're the guy that remembers this shit too and yeah and then we, we just shoot the shit it's really of not really much interest to anybody else except us two idiots but yeah it's yeah he's another guy that yeah it's like and then you get crap. the other musician you bring up stuff like that and they can't remember fucking any of it there that's true there there is that is that, <laughs> is that on that album no that's two albums before that one all, all right yep <laughs> although I, I like i said just a minute ago like 
I go through the list of the episodes and it's like, oh yeah, we did have them on. But then again, it's not like, you know, I've got 16 albums. It's we're talking 500 plus episodes. So it's a little harder to remember every, every one of them. Yeah. I th- I might, one of these days when I'm bored and I'm, I have to be really fucking bored, I might go through the website and actually list the amount of interviews I've done. <laughs> it, it must be a, a couple of hundred at this stage. Um, the oh, last yeah. couple of months, I haven't done many, but uh, that's the way life goes. But um We've yeah, got, we've done a lot. We've been fortunate. Yeah, no, I, I think, and and again, I, yeah, I think people do go, yeah, what the hell's wrong with these guys? But it, I, again, you, you see it. I mean, you go back to Bob. Then there were times where it was just like, all right, I need to simmer out for a while. I'm going to go do some other stuff, and then you come back and stuff. And you know, I mean, it is a lot to do content every week. It, it really is. People don't understand the effort that goes into doing a show like this. Uh-huh. Um, the scheduling. Like, I I just don't email a PR person and they say, oh, yeah, here's the time. Yeah. And then I say yes and it's done. Yeah. That does, that's, that's, that's utopia. Uh-huh. That's not the real world. The real world is you get told no or you get no response at all or you have to chase and then the times don't suit or you have everything set up to go and then you get a really late email or text saying they can't do it, can you do it tomorrow? Yeah. And, you, and of course, you might have moved your schedule around mm-hmm. and you can't and, and you lose the interview even though it's not not your fault or, or the person doesn't call. Yeah. Like the, the classic one I have, and I'm not going to name the guy, he couldn't get the fucking time zone right. <laughs> right? That's right. Three days. <laughs> and then... I I was, the PR guy contacted me after the second time when the guy flaked. Yeah. And he said, oh, he got the time wrong again. Can he, can he do it tomorrow? And I just said, no. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, the, the guy's had fucking two chances to call <laughs> right. me. Right. And I've been ready and he flaked both times. Yeah. And I'm like, sorry, not yeah. my problem, your problem. Yeah. And in fairness to the guy, um, and actually he, he's passed away as well. Uh, Bill Shavis was the PR person. Mm. Um, he was perfectly fine with me. He understood it. Nothing yeah. to do with you. It's just his, his guy yeah. and he fucked up. But, um, yeah. Bob never did though. I can tell you that, Bob, we, I was never had an issue with like arranging a time for, for Bob. And it was always West coast, East coast. The other one was Bill Hale. Bill Hale is freaking Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah. He's well, the eight hours. And, and no problem ever having Bill on. It's like, boom, no problem. And that's another one where, you know, shooting the shit and, um, and I'm sure he's hit hard by, by Bob's passing too. He was actually one of the first people that responded when I put that out on Twitter. Well, what was the book Bill did? The so he did he did two. Was so t- he did um, he did the early days of thrash metal. What he, was that he one did called? The, he did the Metallica, the early Metallica book. Yeah, and then he did the early Megadeth one as well. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he did a lot of great pictures in both of those. Yep. Yeah, and he's got tons. I mean, you if you follow him, he just. He hasn't, he hasn't done it as much lately, but he'll put out great pictures from uh, from all of his stuff, you know, Shanker stuff. And it's just like, yeah, he's got some incredible pictures in mm. his archive. One of the first musicians, I, I'm not on Twitter, so you are. So you you, might, you probably saw it bef- a lot of things before I did. The first musician's feed that popped up that commented on it was Ellison that I saw. Um, Mustaine commented on it. Uh, yeah. posted about it yeah. and I think Metallica did because um, I know Bob was friends with Lars I don't know about James and, and Kirk as much but yeah. definitely Lars because he had Lars on the documentaries oh I mean he was one of the people that was out buying records with Lars that exactly was, we used to have little yeah conversations about Lars but <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I will say we did we we actually got that out there before any of them because they didn't really start actually getting any comments out until like the 31st. Okay. Okay. Right. Anything else you want to talk about? And cheery? It's, yeah. I, I, <laughs> it, I tell you, it, it, it had, like I said, it really it did hit me hard. I, I went out to the girlfriends for New Year's Eve and she's like, Boy, you're really quiet. Even my wife said it to me. She said, uh, what's wrong? And she said, I just found out Bob Nalbandian died. And she said, 
Wasn't that the guy who did, does the podcast and you did a couple with him? I said, yeah. And she looked at me and said, oh, man, I'm really sorry. Yeah, it was. I think it was the suddenness of it. It was just no knowledge of it. And then all of a sudden, like, yeah. you get this text. Yeah. You know, like, it happened, like, the, the same guy, the same guy sent me a text. It was when Neil Peart died and, and Eddie Van Halen died. And when I got the text about Bob, it, n- it nearly hit me as hard as, as those mm. two. Yeah. Because I, I, I'd i spoken to Bob. I kind of knew Bob. Yeah. Um, but, hey. Yeah. Life yeah. goes on, you know. But uh, great guy. Fantastic documentaries. Really yeah, detailed. De- definitely go out, you know, if you haven't yet, check out the Inside Metal series. I There's mean, a lot the, of them. I mean, the idea... That and you can you know listen to the the podcast as well. We talked to Bob about it, but I mean he had such a massively awesome idea because everyone thinks that you know the LA scene started with like poison, you know, and it didn't. And Bob was there, and and you know so that whole first part of of Inside LA Metal where he is talking with people like Stephen Quadros and Carlos Cavazos and you know and on those guys that that were part of that early scene before all the glam and stuff. And, you know, and people don't realize that at the time that, you know, Eddie's doing his stuff out in Pasadena, you have George Lynch in LA, you know, and, and, uh, you know, part of that underpinning and how it was more of the hard rock. And, you know, Bob brings all that out in a great documentary format. And then it isn't until really on part two where you get, okay, now you have, more of the hair metal coming in in those bands. And then then you have the thrash that comes in in part three. But he did it really well because he, he puts that really good underpinning and he's talking to people like Mitch, who we had on the show as well, was, you know, so like really integral to being an influence even on Eddie. I mean, Eddie will say that. Uh, he mentions it in that book I just finished as well. And, and the fact that, that Bob brings out even all these bands and then you look and you go, oh, wow, that guy was in this band and that guy was in this band and you start to connect the dots too of where a lot of that and nobody was really going to bring that out except Bob and he did a great job of it and then and just looking at it in a different way and all of the just sitting on the porch talking to people and and just getting that backstory and, and just really, really well done and I would hope that at some point you know, Carl or the folks at Cleopatra or whatever come and decide to take a lot of that other footage that Bob did because there is a shitload of it and make like some additional content as well because he, you know, he is like an archivist and a historian for all of this and he that's part of what he was trying to do. And yeah, this is so much more stuff that would probably be great to get out and, uh, you know, it's just a matter of sifting through it and, and doing it. And then, you know, then going on with, the Bay Area stuff, which is also just a really good two-part documentary about that one. I think he did an awesome job with that. And again, going back to the beginning stuff and really placing bands like Y&T and how important they were and stuff was great. And um, and then even, you know, band versus brand. See, the thing with Bob was, Bob was there and he lived it. Yeah. If you were an, from an outsider coming in, you'd have to do all this research. Mm-hmm. You hope to ask the right people to come on and talk about it and you yep. hope to get him. Bob knew who to ask. He knew what questions to ask. Yep. Um, he was friends with a lot of these guys. You knew it was going to be handled really, really well. Yeah. Um, and you already brought it up that they could have put Lars on for an hour on each one. Uh-huh. And they didn't because right. he he got, he had to get the snow guys and he had to get the yeah. sound barrier guys. And, and, and Hyrax and, and all these yeah. lesser known names because yeah. he wanted to tell the story properly. Correct. And, and the he thing was is, is that to do it. Bob like I said, you Bob lived it. He wasn't a fanboy about it. He he loved that he was a part of it and he wanted to he wanted to be able to show like all of it, warts and all, to everybody in the best way possible. As yeah. opposed to gilding it or anything else, and and I think he accomplished that. He definitely did. Yeah, he definitely did. And yeah, I'm, I agree. I'd love to hear. 
a lot of the stuff that didn't make it because we know that there's shit tons. Yeah. All these documentaries are all the same. They have an hour and a half, and they probably have ten hours. Right. Audio. It's it's yeah. what how how what to cut cut, and yet still have it flow. Right. Um. Will yeah. it get out there? I, I I can't see it, but it's something I'd love to. Well, love the thing is, is that hear. you know his collaborators. So you know guys like Carl, they were just as involved and as avid about it as Bob. Yeah, and they love doing it with Bob. So there 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 is kind of a a thing there of like you know how do you carry this on if you wanted to and 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 do it right and I think they could and. So it isn't just like, you know, you've got some faceless entity that he was working for doing it, you know? And he got a lot of support from the people at Cleopatra as well. So, I mean, if if it was a normal type of thing, they would have forced him to cut that thing down to single DVDs and go, no, no, we're just putting out the one, cut the hell out of it till we can get this one little single product we want and stuff. And they didn't do that. It was like, no, you know what? No, this has to be done the right way. If it's going to go across two, we're making two parts. That's it. Our three parts. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, I think they're really well done. And the other thing, probably too, we probably both look at it in the same way of wanting it because it's almost like having like a video podcast from Bob as well, because it is that conversational thing we loved listening to with the Skull Sessions. And you're having it with people that you would definitely want to see on a show and hear like all that stuff from them. Mm hmm. Other than Sam Don, who else is doing these Doctor documentaries? Um, There's not many. There isn't. There's I can't think of the guy's name, um, but there was a guy up in San Francisco who's been doing that too, and um, there's the one that Harold O did, and that, and that other guy was involved in that one as well. Um, and there's, so there's a couple, and and I don't really see them. They all seem on to be about cable. They but all I seem to be see them on YouTube. They all seem to be about specific bands, though, not genres. Um, from what I can see, there's been some stuff on San Francisco. There's been like things on hardcore and some things on thrash. Um, I just watched one the other night that was um, just the Rainbow, which was pretty good. But well, that's a few years old, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah that's a, I saw that. That's really good. Yeah, that is really good. Yeah. Which is another one that was um, probably picked a bad week of watching it after Bob passed away. But it was because that one there, you know, they did it in a very clever way where you, you know, you've got Mario talking and you realize the whole thing was made posthumously. You ever go to the Rainbow? No. I mean, no. I've, I was in L.A. and I never went. I don't know why. No, I, I, it was. So when I was in L.A., and that was the ex-wife's modeling thing that year was at the Palladium, um, their like yearly convention or whatever. Um, so Saturday night was that. And then sun so we went Sunday, we went out on the strip, like, yeah, let's do that. And everything was closed. So I ended up, I was in the Alvarez store. Like that was about the only thing that was open. It was funny was going in there and I'm looking around and stuff. And the guy was like, you know, he's oh, your accent, you like from the East Coast? I'm like, yeah, from Boston. He's like, oh, you guys have an incredible music scene out there. And I'm thinking. You're in L.A. Oh, really? <laughs> Everybody's in L.A. Yeah. It was like, nah, I mean, we got some cool bands, but it's not. Yeah, it, it wasn't that. But uh, yeah, but I, yeah, I never, I never got a chance to go to the Rainbow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what else are we going to talk about or you want to wrap it up? Uh, I was, I, you know, the, I, I'm glad we did this. It was really, I think, important just to kind of get some thoughts out on Bob. A lot of respect for the guy. And, and like I said, like, I literally don't think I would have wanted to do a podcast if it hadn't been kind of listening to what Bob was doing and, and being like, yeah, you know, I like that. You know, I like the way that he's doing that and, and, um, yeah, I just, I, I think I would have just stayed with just playing and mixing and, you know, and all that and, and not really done anything else. But um, I think it brought me back into doing kind of, you know, quasi radio again and, and stuff. And uh, yeah, again, a lot of it, you know, was Bob. And again, it's cool. I mean, 
I don't know how he was able to intake everything. You know, granted, he was you know part of the, the cast iron ring. I think you were you were on the show at that point, right? When we I had was. the cast iron ring. Okay, I, I thought so. Yeah, um, I actually still have that app on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, he would always you know call and and be like, hey, you know, I, I liked what you said in this interview, and I want how you did this, and how you guys are doing this, and yeah, he was always like. You know, wow, I like that. Or, you know what, I'm going to steal that. Or, like, yeah, whatever. Like, always, always had a good word about everything. Always had great feedback. Honest. Um, and let you know, like, whether, you know, you were kind of on a good path or not. So, and I, I guess, you know, when I when I talked about and put out on Twitter that, you know, I thought of him as not just, a, you know, as a friend, but as a mentor, is that he did give a lot of guidance to, to uh, what we're doing. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll, it'll it will be missed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a good way to finish. I think. All right. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, definitely, Bob. Thank you. And uh, that is uh, that is a wrap for this week. So uh, for myself and Richie, have yourselves a great metal week. And until we talk to you again, as always, remember focus on metal. Everything else is insignificant. Still here? It's over. Go home.